Welcome to the miraculous San Francisco discovery of Ari Akadi Lokhakov's Lost Art in our series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Executive Director of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. Today, I'm honored to introduce Julie Zigoris, who is an arts and culture reporter for the San Francisco Standard. Before becoming a journalist, she taught English and Soviet history at the University of Pittsburgh, Stanford University, the Jewish Community High School of the Bay, and Mount Tamalpai College in San Quentin Prison. She's the author of Bellomore, Criminality and Creativity in Stalin's Gulag. Pennsylvanian by birth and Hungarian by blood, she's now devoted to all things San Francisco. After Julie's presentation, there will be time for Q&A. So please post your questions. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me today. And thanks to everyone out there listening right now. It's truly such a pleasure to share this story with you that really has been a highlight of my journalism career so far at the San Francisco Standard, where I work. Um, so I'll just give a quick plug for my publication. It's sfstandard.com, and we are the fastest uh, growing Bay Area news publication. Uh, we have no paywall, and we're free to read. Um, and I will be at some point um, sharing updates about this story there and subsequent articles. If you want to keep it, that website um, bookmarked you know, or sign up for our newsletters, I encourage you to do so. So I'm going to take you through this story of the discovery of Ari Arkady Lochakov's art, which is really a pretty miraculous story. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, come up at the end of my presentation. So be sure to keep those in mind. So I'm going to walk you through what happened, the discovery of this lost art in Crane Cove Park. This is a Bayside Park on the east side of San Francisco, very um, sleepy residential area. And one morning in May, 2022, it's a beautiful sunshiny morning, uh, a member of the Port Commission of San Francisco, which oversees this park, oversees Crane Cove Park, walks into the park to do some daily maintenance um, work and stumbles upon 48 pieces of artwork carefully displayed. No morning dew had collected on the artwork, so it was clear they had just been placed there recently. And it was also clear that somebody really wanted them to be found because they were carefully arranged. And the ones that were, you know, more paper art pieces had um, stones or pebbles put on them so that they wouldn't blow away in the bay breeze. And it became apparent to Ariana Cunha, the port uh, employee who first found the artworks, that somebody both wanted to take care of these artworks, but also be sure that someone found them. And it was a very intentional display. So this is actually the first photograph of the artworks that was taken. This is from Ariana's cell phone when she first found um, the art pieces there at Crane Cove Park. So she's walking around these artworks and as she's trying to figure out what they are, as you can imagine in San Francisco, we find lots of things on our streets here. And um, lots of times things are just thrown into the dumpsters and not really um, thought about. And the other maintenance worker who was with her asked, you know, should I put these on the dumpster? Or are we just cleaning this up? And she started walking around the pieces of art. And she, the first thing that stuck out to her was that so many of them were signed and had the same signature, some version of Lochakov, either Ari Lochakov, just Lochakov, Ari Arkady Lochakov. So 38 of the 48 pieces had the signature and ended up being works of art by Lochakov. She also noticed that there were dates on a lot of the artworks and dates ranging from 1920 to 1941, which signaled to her, you know, these were of some value. These were historic art works and historic art pieces. 
Um, so as she walked around looking at these various pieces of art, she realized this is not something to put on the dumpster. This is something that we need to save and take a look at. And I have some examples here of some of the ink drawings um, that were found. And again, you can see the Lochakov signature in the bottom uh, right hand corner there. And the artworks, um, I included some of my favorite ink drawings here that were part of the 38. Um, there were also oil paintings and also prints um, that were there. And so Ariana Kuna, and the, uh, who's a port employee, as well as um, Jermaine Joseph, who was more of a crew worker, maintenance um, cleanup crew, they began to pack up all of the artwork and take it back to um, the port's offices, the port commission's offices, where they could spread them out in their conference room and take a closer look at this miraculous discovery. And I should note this that they did this, um, you know, after having waited there for some time, no one showed up, no one was around, um, there was no one there, any owner of the art that seemed to be nearby or to claim the paintings. Um, most of the oil paintings that were found were on boards, and most of them were portraits. So there were these landscapes um, and portraits. There were also still lifes. Um, and you can see this sort of stylized painting. Um, I'm imagining it may evoke a particular artist for some of you, which uh, I will get to that a bit later. But you can see the range of Lochakov's art here that it was ink drawings, it was paintings, it was portraits, it was still lifes. So it was quite an assembly of art, again, 38 pieces by this one artist. So Ariana and her team spread out the artworks in the conference room and they start to ask themselves, who is this person, Lochakov? Um, sorry, let me, before I get to that, some of, I wanted to also note that some of the artworks were framed. Um, and they were framed and had this um, uh, information on the back that they were framed at this Campbell Wallpaper Company uh, framing store, which existed back in the 50s and 60s and is no longer around in Huntsville, Alabama. So that was sort of another clue that the team was working with in the beginning of why Huntsville, Alabama? Is this an entry point to the United States? Um, from, you know, and again, they weren't sure from Russia, from France, when they looking at the name. Um, so they bring all of this back to their conference room and they ask themselves a question, you know, who is this Lochakov, right? Who's this name that is appearing on all of these artworks, some of which are framed, but in Alabama, and uh, they're trying to put together the pieces of the mystery. So they start researching Lochakov and they find some scant information about him online. Um, he was born in Bessarabia in 1892, which uh, was then the Russian Empire. Um, his family uh, had a photo studio there. So his father was a trained artist and photographer, and Ari Lochikov also did photography. Um, he was a World War I veteran, so he fought um, with the Russian army. Um, and he was a trained artist who moved to Paris um, in the 1920s to pursue his art. Um, so she starts to realize that this is, Ariana realizes this is a real discovery because this is not just any random artist. This is an artist who was part of the Jewish School of Paris. So the School of Paris, and which I'm sure many of you out there who are art lovers have heard of, which includes artists like Marc Chagall, uh, Henri Matisse, very famous artists. Um, and the School of Paris artists also, that school and collective of artists included a great number of Jewish artists. And unfortunately, many of these Jewish artists did not get to finish their career, um, did not take get to have the full span to explore their art because they were murdered or died in the Holocaust. Now, um, you can see Lochakov here. This is a one um, photograph that we have of him. And she learned that as a School of Art Paris artist that Lochakov um, exhibited at very famous exhibitions uh, like that gallery Osman in Paris, the Salon d'Automne 
in Paris. He even had an art show in Chicago in the United States. So again, wondering if that is a potential uh, entry point. It doesn't end up being it, but it's another connection um, to the United States. And as Ariana starts to reach out to some uh, French art experts and specialists who know about the Jewish artists in the School of Paris, uh, she learns that there's really only one known painting by Lochakov, uh, which is a portrait of his best friend, David Knut, uh, with whom Lochakov came to Paris with uh, to study and to practice art. And um, this makes the discovery all the more incredible that there's very little art of this artist uh, that is around and known. And so to suddenly have found 38 pieces of his artwork is all the more incredible. And so this is the portrait of David Knut that Lochakov painted. Um, it sold at auction in 2020. And I uh, just want to point out a couple of things in this painting here. Um, again, you can see the sort of stylized painting and uh, the one that I shared earlier when I said I'd mention again later, you know, it has, especially the earlier one has kind of like a Marc Chagall, um, uh, you know, stylization to it. And again, this would have been part of Lechikov's circle of people he was running with as a school of Paris artist. Now you can see this in this portrait of David Knut, he's holding a woman's face. And that is his wife, the face of his wife, Ariana, David Knut's wife. And David Knut was very active in the Jewish resistance. He was a Jewish resistance fighter, uh, which later became known as the Jewish army, um, fighting persecution of Jews in Nazi-occupied Paris. And this uh, head that he's holding of Ariana is all the more poignant when you know that Ariana was murdered by the French militia in 1945. And so this head that she is, that he is carrying while stylized and symbolic ends up being, um, you know, all the more meaningful uh, when you know about Ariana's fate. And I will just add here that it, Ariana is also the name of the woman who came across this art. So she had a very goosebump feeling when she was learning about this painting. That was the one known painting of Lechikov's and knowing that David Knut's wife was also named Ariana. And I have also had my own goosebump moments working on this story, which I will get to a, a bit later. So the reason we know anything at all about Lechikov and, you know, any of his biographical details or who he is really can all be attributed to a Yiddish journalist and writer named Hirsch Fenster. Hirsch Fenster made a promise to the Jewish members of the School of Paris. He said, I promise to tell your story. I promise to keep your memory and your, your artwork alive. And so Hirsch Fenster on his own dime, he didn't get any sort of uh, official publishing deal for this book. He published his own book about these artists, the circle of artists in 1951 in Yiddish. There were just 350 copies. So you can imagine how easy it could have been for this story to be lost entirely, right? But Hirsch Fenster decided he would take on this work himself, even if he didn't have a large, you know, audience or publishing deal at the time. He took the work on himself and he created this compendium about the Jewish members of the School of Paris. And it's very different from other kinds of art books in the sense that it's not just about where they exhibited or what their artworks are like. Um, it's anecdotal. It includes impressions of the artists, what they were like as people, what their friends thought of them, conversations about the artists. And so it's really um, has, as well as critical reviews of um, exhibitions of the artists. So there's a lot in there. Um, the section on Lochikov is quite short. It's only two pages and there's not a lot of information. Lochikov, even as in his time, uh, remained somewhat mysterious. Uh, Fenster says he's a man of few words. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. 
Uh, he kind of keeps to himself. He's more on the quiet side. And he says that um, he is a man, you can only say he is a man with a soul as pure as crystal, right? So this is what uh, Fenster shares about Lochikov um, in this, in this uh, book. Um, so, uh, and of course, this is not just about Lochikov. There's 84 artists that are commemorated in this book by Lochikov. And here's are some pinned up uh, images of some of them. And what's very interesting and compelling about this book is that even though, you know, the Nazis wanted to to paint Jews with one brush, you know, and lump them together and exterminate them. The beauty of this book is it shows the variety uh, within the school of Paris, Jewish artists. There are men, there are women, there are oil painters, there are ink drawers, there are different personalities, right? So it's really a quite a marvelous and diverse group of 84 artists. There are some uh, Jewish artists who are very uh, religious, others who are not, right? So it's it's a broad range um, of that's collected in this book by Hirsch Fenster. Now, again, I mentioned there were very few um, copies of this book and we would not even know about this book um, most likely or have been able to draw the connection to today in, in San Francisco um, without the Museum of Contemporary Art and History or excuse me, not contemporary, just art and history in Paris, who uh, led an exhibition and is continuing to lead an exhibition on the lost Jewish artists of the School of Paris. So they are actively seeking uh, images, photographs, artworks of this group of 84 artists. And that is who Ariana eventually connected with um, about these lost artworks. And that is eventually will be the new home of these 38 artworks by Lochakov is this museum in Paris of Jewish art and history um, who are actively seeking them. Um, I will also add that museum translated Hirsch Fenster's book into French, making it much more accessible. Um, there's not an English version of it um, yet, but having the book in French has also uh, opened the doors for more people to study and learn about um, these artworks and more and more people are starting to uh, become aware of this group and um, starting to bring out artworks that are by them. And funnily enough, even just since the Lochakov story, since I wrote the story in the standard, there are artworks that have appeared of Lochakovs at on websites at auction houses. So it's it's incredible. And I will come back to this point a bit uh, later about how you shine a light on something. And uh, it's it brings so much attention, right? So Ariana spoke with uh, Pascal Samuel, Samuel, a curator um, at this Parisian museum, um, who shared a lot with her about Lochakov and about these various exhibitions he was part of and the historical significance. So as this research is going on, and you know, Ariana also spoke with another woman named Nadine um, Niesauer, who is uh, lives in Israel and who was gifted the archives of Hirschfenster by Hirschfenster's daughter. So she has all of the materials and original source materials about these lost artists. So she's Ariana is having conversations with both of these women you know, learning the tr real significance of this mir truly miraculous find at Crane Cove Park in San Francisco. And she is writing to her bosses saying, we need to figure out what to do with this artwork. We need to find a permanent um, home for it. After exploring the possibilities with some local San Francisco museums and realizing uh, really the best place um, for this artwork would be the museum in Paris, the Museum of Jewish Art and History, um, where they are actively seeking these artworks and uh, making them accessible to the public um, for research purposes and for appreciation. And so um, that is how what was ended up being decided to, to be done with the artworks is to transfer them from San Francisco, where they still are in storage at the port, 
to the museum in Paris. But that still leaves us with the question of how did these artworks end up on a park bench, right, in San Francisco? How, you know, we know the significance of Lochakov, we know the miraculousness of the find, but it still was a mystery how exactly they got onto that park bench. So I mentioned that a few of the art pieces were prints, and this is an example of kind of the style of one of the prints. This is an image that the Ghetto Fighters House Museum in Israel um, has in their collection. So I'm sharing it here um, because the Ghetto Fighters House Museum plays a key role in unraveling some of the mystery of how those artworks ended up where they did. So Ariana, as part of her research, had knowing Lachikov was Jewish, had started reaching out to various um, Jewish organizations, including the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. And there they had several works of Lachikov um, and they had a letter accompanied with the works of art that were all prints that looked like this, wartime prints, images of war. And the letter had a family tree in it and the family tree showed that uh, Ari Arkady Lochakov, who previously they thought he had no living family members, Ari Lochakov um, didn't have any children, didn't have an immediate family to pass these artworks onto. But he did have a nephew and that nephew moved to the United States and that nephew married a woman um, who lived in New York City and um, her name was Inga Traub. And uh, eventually after the nephew, his name is Michael, Michael Lochakov, Michael Lochakov and Inga Traub got divorced and Inga Traub remarried a man, a psychiatrist in Huntsville, Alabama. So that brings us back to the framing store that I mentioned earlier. And the two of them moved to Huntsville, Alabama. So this is now Inga Traub and her new husband. And um, Inga Traub had a sister, Lori, Lori Traub. And Lori Traub had a daughter named Diane Sammons. And Diane Sammons was a UCSF nurse in San Francisco. So the connection, again, it's through the aunt, through the nephew, and then through the aunt of Diane Sammons. So Diane Sammons' aunt was um, married to the nephew of Ari Lochakov. So it's a very convoluted route, but it gets us to San Francisco. And then in my course of reporting on this story, I was able to... Uh, Unfortunately, Diane Sammons had already passed away. She died in um, 2019. But um, I found uh, the phone number of her longtime partner, a man named jo John McGree, who lives in San Rafael in Northern California. And I was able to talk to John McGree and confirm he was a, the partner of Diane Sammons for 20 years. And he said, Yes, 100% those artworks belong to Diane Sammons. They were on her walls, uh, on the family's walls in the family home in Huntsville, Alabama. So he, as her partner, they traveled back to Huntsville, Alabama every year to visit family, um, to visit um, her aunt Inga, who herself has an amazing story and was uh, part of uh, the resistance, the Jewish resistance. And so um, he was able to establish that San Francisco connection. While we still don't know how, since Diane died in 2019, we don't know how they got onto the bench, but it's clear that Diane inherited this artwork from her family. And a lot of reader questions to my first article I'd written on this subject pointed out that Huntsville, Alabama was the... Um, the city where Operation Paperclip took place. So this was an operation that trained more than a thousand Nazi scientists um, to in rocket technology, who were Nazi trained scientists in rocket technology, brought them to the United States so we could take advantage of their knowledge. Um, and this 
operation took place in Huntsville, Alabama. So there were, you know, over a thousand, you know, uh, again, Nazi trained scientists living there. And a lot of our readers thought that could be the connection, right? Or, you know, maybe somebody um, brought them, you know, one of the scientists brought them from, from Germany, which is a very interesting, uh, compelling lead, but again, ended up not being the pathway um, since the family pathway was what uh, ended up being the real story here. So as a reporter, I tried to figure out how can I make that, that last step of how they got from Diane Salmon's apartment or condo to being on this park bench. And I found that she owned a condo in San Francisco on the other side of the city. I found the real estate agent. I contacted them, um, figured out when the, the house was put on the market, and then contacted the uh, people who were tasked with cleaning out her apartment. And believe it or not, they gave me photos of her apartment and condo before um, it was put on the market. And so you can imagine I looked at these with great anticipation trying to figure out, would I see the artworks here? Would I be able to establish that link uh, for sure? And it was somewhat sad looking at these photos, to be honest, because the, the apartment was in quite a state of disarray and there was just, you know, a lot of um, belongings strewn around and it looked um, kind of ransacked. Um, but I did have a heart-stopping moment when you can see on the right, this is a picture that was from her apartment and it's, well, it's, I can't read the writing, but it's in English and it's not Lochakov. Um, I think it bears almost an uncanny resemblance to one of the art pieces that was found at Crane Cove Park on the left, which you can see that is signed by Lochakov. So there was something even just in the eyes, mysteriously looking up at me um, that I felt this connection. So while I wasn't able to uh, completely put a nail on how the, the artworks ended up on the park bench, um, I did speak with um, John Magri's, uh, or sorry, not John Magri, I, I, I figured out the next of kin um, for Diane Sammons, um, who would have been the, the people who would have gotten the estate of Diane Sammons. Uh, it was a half brother in Florida. And John Magri had mentioned this half brother in Florida, and I could not find his name. I didn't, John Magri, Diane Salmon's partner, didn't know his name because uh, Diane Salmons did not have any children. But again, through some sleuthing and some court documents, I was able to find her next of kin, the brother living in Florida. And um, I spoke with him on the phone and his wife was the one who came out and cleaned out the apartment, uh, the condo of uh, Diane Salmons. And she told me that when she got there, the condo had already been totally picked over and her belongings had been, um, you know, looked through and there was no artwork there. So who knows, right? Somebody, maybe somebody going through Diane Salmon's apartment and took the artwork and then later had a change of heart and felt bad about it and put it on the bench. Um, you know, we'll never totally know for sure that last piece of the mystery. Um, but in the meantime, I think this remains an incredible story. And, um, you know, one of my favorite lines that uh, from this original story I wrote about this discovery is that this was a nesting doll of near misses with oblivion. And the reason I love this line is because I, I think about all the times that Ari Lochakov could have been lost, right? Uh, you know, first, just his art being lost after he died um, from malnutrition and starvation in Nazi-occupied Paris, right? His artwork was, the studio was looted or artworks were sold at auction and he could have been entirely lost then and his name forgotten had it not been for Hirsch Fenster who made that decision to commemorate um, the Jewish members of the um, School of Paris Artists Collective. And now Hirsch Fenster in turn, you know, only had only had the ability to make 350 copies of his book and it was in Yiddish, a language that we know not 
you know, not a lot of people speak and is itself, you know, fewer and fewer people speaking it. So again, this could have been a way in which the our logical story and the other artist stories could have been lost entirely and we would not know um, of their existence. But then the French Museum, the Museum in Paris of the uh, Jewish Museum of Art and History decided to resuscitate this book, decided to publish it in French, decided to start this exhibition, decided to start actively collecting. So again, we have this moment. But then there's a San Francisco chapter of this because this artwork appeared on a park bench and you know, no one would have known about this story. I was the only news outlet to cover this story. And the only way I knew about it is because there was a port commission memo to uh, kind of rubber stamp the transfer of these artworks to uh, Paris. But when those artworks were put out on that bench, what if somebody other than Ariana had come across them? Somebody who just threw them on the dumpster and thought, oh, more San Francisco street garbage, right? What if somebody, you know, no one else found the story to report to the larger public? I took an interest in the story in part because of my own background. And this story felt just like Ariana felt fated to discover this story because of David Knut's wife's name. I also felt fated to discover this story because I speak Russian, I speak French. Um, I was able to do the research um, that was required to write this story. And so uh, it was another potential loss connection that became a connection. And now because of the story, more and more people are talking about Lochakov. Artwork is surfacing by him. Um, the museum is re receiving emails and calls. Um, and it just goes to show my other kind of final um, point I'd like to make uh, my experience or lesson of working on this story is how much paying attention to something creates value. Because again, nobody was valuing those artworks at first on the bench and they weren't, um, you know, they were going to quietly transfer to Paris without any San Franciscans even knowing that they had gone through um, the city or even knowing they had been there. And now since the story, I'm getting, you know, email requests from readers, where can I see the art? I want to see the art. You know, this is, um, people want to buy the art. People are asking me how they can purchase the art. Um, and while originally, you know, the Port Commission was just going to send the artworks to Paris, now they are actually not only going to show them at the port commission shed which was sort of the original plan but now they're exploring the potential of a full exhibition um at the contemporary jewish museum in san francisco um with you know invited guests and panels and you know so it's it's just incredible how something can i think uh so fascinating how something can go from being lost to appreciated or seemingly valueless to um, extremely valuable, right? Just from the attention you put on it, just from the time that you spend trying to understand the history or the provenance of something or the biography of the, of the artist and the creator. So it really has been such a uh, a deep pleasure to work on this story and um, to learn about Lochakov, to feel that I have some small role in making sure that he and his artwork and his legacy doesn't die, but lives on. And, you know, I see this seminar today as yet another opportunity for that. So thank you to all of you who are also keeping his spirit alive right now by being here and by listening. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Julie. And I actually want to start our uh, uh, Q&A um, with thanking very much uh, Baron Hamil, who is part of the San Francisco community and made me aware of your, uh, of your publications. So without her, uh, we wouldn't have met and we wouldn't do this event. So thank you, Baron, for for doing that. Um, and 
Yeah, I uh, I believe you have a very strong point with the attention that uh, creates value, which is you know what we're trying to do with with these with these event and um um so you were talking about uh that Locha, uh, uh, um uh, early history, his upbringing uh, resonated with your background. Um, would you? Uh, it would be. I would be very interested to hear a little bit more about your background, but also about the early early life story of uh, Lojakov. Like where where do the two of you meet? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, well, one, I'll say right off the bat, I'm not Jewish, so it wasn't because of his Jewish background that I felt connected to him, but it was more um, because of his uh, background in the Russian Empire and, you know, also having an artist father. So my my dad is Hungarian, uh, and he was a painter, um, in addition to being, he was also a doctor, but painted um, on the side, and um he was a political refugee um, from communism and he fled um, because he was being persecuted. Um, and his his father was a Protestant minister. And so as you can imagine in communist Hungary, having any kind of um, religious affiliation in an atheist country was not allowed. Um, and so his family was forced to move to the countryside and my dad felt increasingly um, constrained by life in uh, communist Budapest and eventually escaped um, with his best friend Zoltan. And there was something about, you know, Ari Lochakov escaping Bessarabia and, you know, the environment there um, being persecuted already. You know, the anti-Semitism in the Russian Empire was extremely virulent. Um, and so escaping to a better world uh, in Paris and where there was, you know, the Paris at that time was not only an artistic capital, but it was also a capital of human rights and, um, you know, where where our Lochakov could find freedom. And so I felt the same about uh, my dad when he left Hungary with his best friend Zoltan and um, came to Boston and, you know, lived in the States as a place that was also, um, you were free to say and do um, whatever you thought and you didn't have the the constrictions and restrictions of, of uh, the communist regime. So there was that connection. And then there was also just the language connection, you know, looking at some of these pieces and some of the research Ariana had collected and some of it was in Russian and there were stamps and she's like, oh, I can't read this or this certificate that was in Russian. And since I read Russian, um, but I also speak French, I um, lived in France for a year um, in school. And so I was able to speak with Pascal Samuel. I was able to speak with Nadine um, in French, rusty, but I understood everything. Um, and also read the documents in Russian. And so I felt this connection with Ari Lochakov, like I was the person who was meant to find this story and report this story. And the reason other news outlets hadn't found it or hadn't picked up on it was because this was somehow, and I know this sounds very California woo-woo, but it felt like it was meant for me um, to discover. And so it's been, yeah, I, I want to keep exploring the story. It's been hard for me to, to let go of it because I feel such a kind of deep emotional connection to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very clearly clear to, to sense in your, in your writing and in the way you present, mm -hmm. present this whole mystery and find. Um, uh, so could you recall again, like a little bit more the the early history of of uh, uh, Lochakov, how he, why he came to Paris, um, from where he came to Paris, mm -hmm. um, just to um, because he was not the only one who came to Paris from from Eastern Europe, right? No, there were many. I mean so many of the artists, the majority of the 84 artists in Hirsch Fenster's book are all from Eastern Europe and Russia and surrounding areas. And, you know, many of them have different names today and are different places like Bessarabia, where Lechakov came from, is 
today would modern day would be the Republic of Moldova and part of Ukraine. So, um, but the Russian empire was vast and contained many of the countries of Eastern Europe that how we know them today. Um, and so he was not alone. This was a very vibrant, um, uh, kind of active community, um, Haim Soutine was an, another one that that comes to mind. Um, there are many, many artists that um, fled, again, per, you know, anti-Jewish sentiments in Eastern Europe and uh, and came to Paris because of the their the freedom, not just to practice art, but also uh, to escape persecution. So. And you can see David Knut, you know, his best friend that he came with, um, became a lot of these artists also became, you know, active members of the Jewish resistance. They were fighting, you know, for Jews in Nazi occupied Paris. So this was part of their um, legacy. Now, while David Knut was not, he was more of a writer, he wasn't an artist um, within the School of Paris. Um, he was another person who was fleeing that uh, persecution in um, Eastern Europe. So, um, but, you know, Lochakov also practiced art back in his home, homeland. He was, I think I mentioned his, his father ran a photography studio. Uh, his brother was trained as a photographer. Ari Lochakov also worked in the photography studio for some time. So there were, it was a very common sort of um, pathway that a lot of artists um, from Eastern Europe were coming to Paris and Paris was seen as sort of the, you know, the artistic capital of the world at the time and also a place where um, you could be Jewish and not be afraid. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was, Lachikov was not alone in this for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and of course a lot of a lot of the the Eastern European artists followed Chagall, Satin, and so on, who uh, came to came to Paris much earlier. Because of course there was also Berlin as a center of of uh, of the arts and of culture between uh, the first and second world war. But um, as we know, that changed a lot. So. Paris got more and more crowded with uh, creatives and uh, and um, artists uh, who were fleeing persecution. Um, so, um, yeah, and Mark should just to jump in real quick because I'm not sure if I mentioned this during the talk. Um, Mark Chagall also wrote the introduction for Hirschfenster's book about the Jewish artists of the School of Paris. So again, this was part of this community very much, you know, names that we know and recognize are incredibly famous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Ruth is asking, given given the, the growing political instability and anti-Semitism around the world, is Paris the safest place for these almost lost Jewish artworks to go? Uh, like, was there an alternative that was discussed where, where the art could go or... Um, was yeah. It, so, it, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and sadly, I would say it's, you know, not just Paris, you know, where anti-Semitism is growing, but sadly, everywhere around the globe right now, because, you know, you could think, would Israel be safe? Would San Francisco be safe? You know, there's, it's scary to think about, but it makes you wonder if there is a safe place really ever. Um, but Again, this kind of goes back to this question of attention creating value because, you know, apparently when the port was first speaking with San Francisco institutions like the San Francisco Arts Commission, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, which is sort of our big uh, Jewish art museum here in San Francisco, um, they were not interested in the artworks, you know, they didn't want them. They didn't feel like it was the right home or they had the context or the ability to present them. And now since my story came out and the public knows about this and, and they're very engaged with the story, the local San Francisco population, 
they're very much questioning, you know, why aren't these artworks staying in San Francisco? These were found here. They belong here. They want them here, you know, and um, they they wish that they had been, you know, kind of kept by the Contemporary Jewish Museum or some other local art museum. Um, but given that, I mean, one, the, the documents and everything have already been signed off to send them to the museum in Paris, but also it is true that the Parisian Museum is hosting this exhibition, this ongoing exhibition of artists uh, from Jewish artists from the School of Paris. And so people who are actively looking for this and seeking this material will will already, they will be in context with other artists from um, Jewish artists from the School of Paris at this museum. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it is the best home for them. Although I, I do, I definitely understand the, the, participants question and, and concern you know yeah I mean it's it's I I agree with you the the context matters a lot and uh I just hope that the museum will put their collection online so we can you know mm -hmm. that a further search um will be will be easier for those who are gut interested and you know i'm i'm sure i i know people are eager to also discover other names in in the same context and so on once you you know are made aware that that there was a whole community you ask yourself who was who do do i not know about uh who was also part of the community so um yeah that that uh would probably much much faster happen here in the United States that that the works were uh, would be digitally uh, made accessible but um yeah I agree the the context matters and this is where he lived most you know a big chunk of his adult life so that should be respected as well I think for sure that's also you know an excellent point i mean it's it's where he moved to it's where he practiced his art it's where he exhibited his art so it is a, a natural home for him in that sense um and i will say you know if my dealings so far with the uh museum i have full confidence that they will do everything you know possible to make the artwork accessible and viewable and shareable. And um, they really, they have as their mission to preserve these artists. And, you know, just the translation of Hirsch Fenster's book alone into French has has opened up the doors for so much more study mm -hmm. and knowledge. And so they, they that's really their, their mission and their goal. So I have confidence they will do that. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. Um, so uh do you know the the time time frame like when this body of work is is traveling to uh, to to paris when mm. when uh, uh is is the exhibition planned in in san francisco because because now you've you found people who are interested to see the artwork in uh, in uh, the originals so yeah yeah and this is probably the most frequent question I get is when can I see the art? When's the <laughs> art going to be displayed? Um, and I'm in, you know, I'm in communication with the port. They have not set a date yet. And, you know, there's not a date yet set for the transfer to Paris either. Um, so I think they're still, you know, they're actively working on it to figure out what is the best way, especially now in light of the increased attention, you know, how they want to do this, where they want to do it. Um, and so it is all TBD. There's nothing decided yet. Um, but again, I will, I will certainly have a follow up whenever they do, um, you know, announce the details of the exhibition and and what the what the plan is for that. Fabulous, yeah, yeah, fabulous. Um, someone is asking something very different. Um, asking about uh, your upbringing in in Pittsburgh uh which neighborhood you came <laughs> you're from and which high school you did attend I guess the uh attendee is is also from Pittsburgh <laughs> <I would think. laughs> nice 
Um, love it. I love the Pittsburgh pride. Um, so I actually grew up in central Pennsylvania, not, I went to graduate school in Pittsburgh. Um, so I lived in Greenfield, which is a little neighborhood next to Squirrel Hill. Um, and I hung out most of the time in Squirrel Hill, went to the 61 C cafe a lot to have coffee and work on my dissertation, um, and the Squirrel Hill public library. So I am definitely, I love Pittsburgh and, um, it is a place that I um, I miss very much. And um, although I didn't go to high school there and I, I do creative writing also um, on this side and my current novel that I'm working on is set in Pittsburgh and it's been so fun to write it because I get to revisit all my favorite places <laughs> as I'm writing it and working on it. So yeah, I um, even though I didn't grow up in Pittsburgh because I lived there for six years during grad school, it, uh, and I grew up in, in Pennsylvania, just east of Pittsburgh. It, um, it really feels like home to me. Mm -hmm. It's a big change from, from the East Coast to, to the West Coast, for sure. 